If you know me personally, you'd know I can't shut up about Sega, especially their arcade games. I've always been a fan of Sega stuff. I had Sonic's Genesis collection at a young age. I didn't get to play every game, but I love some of their arcade ports like Flicky, Columns, Altered Beast, and Bonanza Bros. In fact, I didn't even know these were arcade games until one of my favorite pizza places had one of those iCades that I played Congo Bongo on, but I never got to try one of their best classic titles, Fantasy Zone. As much as I played Flicky, I could never get that many points to unlock it. Now I can in one shot, but keep in mind, I was stupid. Sonic 1 ended at Marble Zone. As I've gotten older, my appreciation for arcades has grown building up my launch box setup and trying all the obscure stuff, discovering Galloping Ghost and having to visit when we make our family Chicago trips, and eventually getting the Saturn, which quickly became my favorite console. You're not an arcade fan until you've tried some Sega games. Sega were the kings of the arcades until they weren't. They've been making games since the early 60s. Those weren't even video games. They were electromechanical. Have you played an electromechanical arcade game? Over the past year, I've become Sega obsessed, and with that came finally playing Fantasy Zone. It's the 35th anniversary of the series, and with that, I've made an extra special tribute video slash retrospective. Because Sega sure as hell won't acknowledge poor Opa Opa. It's my job to do just that. Let's take it way back to 1986 and start with the original. After the massive success of Gradius, Sega wanted to compete in that shoot 'em up genre and hired Yoji Ishii to make a Gradius kill. It was originally going to be all sci-fi and space themed, but in an effort to stand out, they flipped the genre on its head and made a bright and cheery pastel world. Pretty large inspiration for the series was Brazilian culture, with the visuals and music being bright and bouncy. Opa Opa, the player's name, is based off of Upa, a South American slang expression for excitement or surprise. Taking some inspiration from Pac-Man, they wanted to make a game to appeal to the casual audience. But Fantasy Zone ended up being pretty challenging for a newbie, even in the first stage, so the non-gamer wasn't really grabbed by this game quite like Pac-Man, but to the arcade goer, Fantasy Zone was a hit. Ishii set out to do something that had never been done before, and did just that. This game was completely unique and novel. Like I mentioned before, the aesthetic now dubbed as Cute 'em Up was only really seen once before with Twinbee, but this game was horizontal, and you controlled the scrolling. The parts shop was also a new mechanic. To Ishii, just grabbing a floating power-up didn't make sense. Instead, you had to snatch up coins dropped from enemies and catch a balloon to the parts shop. Keep in mind, currency and shopping in video games was also a new concept, giving this game more appeal. Fantasy Zone stood out. It did so many things, not to mention, it was really fun. The little creatures are memorable, power-ups are fun to save for, and man, those bosses. The bosses are a highlight of this game. Challenging, but fun to learn. Working on strategies to take out these bosses in a flash is what Fantasy Zone is all about. What I love about this game is the journey it takes to beat it. You start out pretty bad, losing all three lives in the first world, but you experiment, learn the base placements, try out some power-ups, figure out what each enemy does, and after that, seeing a brand new stage to learn the ins and outs of. It's just an exemplar classic game has all the great gameplay and mechanics and replayability of arcade game design while being unique and charming. You'll pick up on this one pretty quick, and all you non-shmup fans out there a little intimidated by the genre, this is a great game to start with. It is far less challenging than some of those other popular games out there. In fact, I think this game has a lot in common with the Kirby series. Let me explain. Both were made to get more casual players into the genre, they're bright and colorful with friendly looking characters, and they have great music. But one hasn't gotten a game in 30 years. Can you guess who? Don't let that deter you from the series. Just because it's dead doesn't mean that you shouldn't play it. In fact, I'm gonna give you a few tips and tricks to get started. Hell, could you imagine if Fantasy Zone stuck around like Sonic? I guarantee you the series wouldn't have that reputation of every game is good. Alright, starting out, here's something about the game that definitely takes a bit to get used to. The camera. It is not age the greatest. It's awesome that you can explore these worlds and take out the bases however you'd like, but you can get pretty close to the camera without it scrolling. It's almost like how the original Zelda scrolls, but the game doesn't freeze when you get to the end. That would have been infinitely worse, but this one still isn't the best. Basically, after firing, you can get to the edge of the screen, and if you proceed fast, you could run into something that you didn't see coming. So yeah, adapting to the camera may take a few tries, but once you get used to it, you'll no longer be affected by it. Also, every enemy doesn't have to be taken out. What you want to focus on are the bases. Most enemies will go away if you fly past them. If something gets in your way, shoot it down, but otherwise you don't have to go out of your way to take everything out unless you're short on coins. If you aren't short on coins, here are some tips for the shop. Jet Engine and Twin Bombs. These two are absolutely essential. There are four engine upgrades, and the Jet is the best. Biglings are alright, but it's worth it to save for the Jet. 
But turbo and rocket? Way too fast. You could possibly get good with the turbo engine, but it doesn't make the game easier for you. But the rocket engine? Only useful on the final boss. Plus, it's way too expensive. Don't spend your cash on these unless you absolutely need them. Twin bombs. Super cheap, and they'll stay until you die. It is exactly what it sounds like. You get two bombs. Simple, but effective. You will need these. The other power-ups are temporary. The shots run out of time, and the other bombs are one use. The best temporary shot is the seven way. Once you get up close and have all seven shots firing on a base, they go out instantly. The heavy bomb is stupid powerful. Anything it touches gets instantly knocked out. However, in the first two levels, you don't even need to spend money. With practice, you can run through these empty-handed. By level three, it is a good time to pick up the jet engine and twin bombs. Those are especially helpful for the boss. You can use other power-ups to completely cheese the bosses. If you go to the bottom right corner of the screen and drop a heavy bomb on Koba Beach, insta-die, get three smart bombs on Krabunga, insta-die. That guy's from level four, which is also exploitable. If you grab a laser beam at the very start and move quickly, you can beat the whole level instantly and not even worry about getting hit. However, level five is where things start to get tough. The bases take a lot more hits to take out now, so it might be smart to pick up a seven-way shot or laser beam. The boss here gave me a lot of trouble. A family of snow penguins create a bullet hell. You can only hit the ones in the back once the other rows are completely knocked out. This was extremely challenging. The first row only takes two hits, but damn, that is a lot of bullets, and I can barely see them. Yeah, this thing gave me a bunch of game overs. I thought you just had to power through it, but there is a strategy. Take out the first row of Pop Zoo, then take out the two in the middle. After that, you just gotta wait it out, and they stop firing. Now, you could wait on any phase or combination of killed and not killed Pop Zoo, but this way has the least amount of bullets, and they're the easiest to dodge. The other levels don't really have tricks. With the two left, you pretty much just have to use your skill. The ending is a bit of a retro cliche, a boss rush. Each boss is slightly harder, and they don't drop coins. Finally, Oh Papa, follow the patterns of the five aliens and take them out. The ending seems a little Star Wars inspired. Opa Opa's long lost father turns out to be the leader of the enemy forces. Opa Opa begins to have some mixed emotions and questions if his victory was really worth the price he had to pay. This game having a story out of left field isn't explained too well in this version. They included it in the manuals of the home ports. Why not look at those? There are quite a few ports of this game. The most famous being the Sega Master System port. At first, I wasn't too into this version. You could say I was pretty spoiled on only playing the arcade release. The graphics take a significant hit. Colors are muted, details lost, it certainly is an 8-bit conversion. Man, the bases don't even change color depending on how badly they're hit. In fact, they don't move either. No radar too. That makes things harder to navigate. Some of the more impressive bosses that showed off the high definition mega power of the System 16 board from the future just couldn't be done on the pathetically weak 8-bit hardware. So they changed them. This is actually kind of neat. Instead of making those bosses crappy, they just made different ones. After playing for a little while, I've grown to like this version. It isn't really the same experience as the arcade, more so a different one, and it is quite a bit easier than the original too. On my first try, I didn't expect to get to level 7, especially with the bosses I've never seen, but despite that, I still had some fun with this one. I pretty much just started my Master System collection, but this game is certainly a must-have on the list. If you're a fan of the console, this seems like one of the better games on there, so definitely consider picking it up. But wait! The story! In the arcade, you only got to catch the ending of it, but in the home versions, they could write stuff in the manuals. The evil Menon have destroyed the interplanetary monetary system in order to gain power throughout the fantasy zone. Opa Opa is sent out to fight the Menon and restore peace to the zone. What if you were a normal person and didn't have a Sega Master System? Two things, you would have friends at school, and two, you could play a worse version of Fantasy Zone. And if you had a 7800 instead of an NES, you would have no friends or Fantasy Zone. Similar to Tetris, there are two versions of this game for different regions, but it's flipped. Japan got the better version, so let's look at that first. Fantasy Zone on the Famicom was ported over by Sunsoft. Yup, even though Sega had their own console, they dabbled in some ports to other systems. Though, once the console wars were starting to pick up, this stuff stopped happening. If you need to show someone that the Sega Master System has double the colors of the NES, this is a great example. Just look at the two side by side. This one does have something over the Master System port though. The radar. It's cool they added it back, but the score panel at the bottom is just a little too big. This port also doesn't have the two changed bosses. The Master System definitely could have handled these guys if the NES can. 
The controls feel worse, especially the collision detection. It's all over the place. Other than that, this is a fairly decent port. While the Master System felt like a more unique take on the game, this is more aligned with the arcade. While that may be a positive, it isn't 1987, so you have several options to play the arcade version. So I'd play the Master System release before this one. Tengen were the ones who published the Sega Famicom games in the West, but since Sunsoft did this port, there were some licensing issues preventing them from releasing this version here. So what did Tengen do? They made their own, and it's awful. The first thing anyone will notice are the graphics. I'm sorry I ever criticized you, Master System. But what makes this port absolutely dreadful is how it plays. Horrible scrolling, sprite flicker, and crap controls. The hallmarks of a bad NES game. This is just sad. The developers had to have played the Sunsoft original, made this game, and thought, yeah, this is worse, but we need the money. Problem is, there's no money in Fantasy Zone here. The series bombed in America. Would you believe me if I told you the ports get worse? You should, because they sure as hell do. That was the MSX version. Don't get me wrong, I love the MSX. If you aren't familiar with it, it's a Japanese home computer known for its shmups. A great game to show off, isn't it? Scrolling. Oh god, the scrolling. It is just abysmal. I don't have to explain it. Just look how choppy it is. The footage says enough. The arcade game has bright, colorful, and detailed graphics. The MSX isn't good at doing that, so everything blends into the background and looks like a big, colorful mess. Don't play this. Even if you have an MSX, it's just not a good game on the platform. Turning things around with the PC Engine port. This one is decent. The graphics are quite arcade accurate. If they weren't, that would be a problem. The engine can definitely handle this. The only weak part is the music. Don't get me wrong, I love the PC Engine sound chip. In fact, I think it's my favorite sounding retro console, but they just didn't do a good job on the audio with this game. The best way to explain this is an audio comparison. So here's one of those. the greatest. However, that's my only issue with the game. This plays fantastic, but I've saved the best for last, the Sharp X68000 version. This Japanese computer is very special. It's home to quite a few arcade accurate ports. Is Fantasy Zone good here? Of course it is. In fact, it's better. Not only is it nearly indistinguishable from the arcade version, it adds an extra stage. And not just any stage, a Space Harrier stage. Yep, if you've played Space Harrier, you've heard this iconic line at the start. Welcome to the Fantasy Zone. Get ready! These games indeed take place in the same universe. If you're a big stupid Sega fan like me, this one is definitely worth giving a shot. In an emulator. The X68000 is stupid rare and expensive. There are also modern ports, but we'll get to those later. So yeah, if you're a retro collector, Go for the Master System and PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16 ports. Maybe dabble in the Famicom port, but stay away from the NES and MSX. Fantasy Zone needed a sequel. It got one. Fantasy Zone 2, The Tears of Opa Opa. Set 10 years after the first game, the enemy forces are back in the Fantasy Zone trying to do the same thing. You probably noticed that I'm playing the Master System version. There wasn't initially an arcade release. Well, there is a System E port, but for the most part it's the same, except for a timer. I prefer the Master System port because of that nice FM soundtrack. This game isn't just more levels for Fantasy Zone, it adds the warp mechanic. Levels are split up into a bunch of smaller parts and you can travel by entering a warp from a destroyed base. This makes the game much more suited for home play. The whole game takes a slower, more exploration-based approach. Maybe a little too slow. I find Opa Opa's base speed to be unbearable. It is just way too sluggish. But there's the shop. Instead of being a balloon, it's just a static cloud, and sometimes there can be two shop clouds in a level. They don't just have everything scrolling in a list. Instead, they each have six power-ups. 
Everything from the last game is here along with some cool new stuff. The normal engine is basically this game's jet engine. What they did is added this after the big wings, making everything after that faster. Basically, instead of four speed increments, there are five. Fireball is a gun now. It's pretty much the same thing as the firebomb from the last game, but shoots one way. Big bombs, bombs that are bigger. And finally, the big shot. Twice the firepower is the twin shot, but it doesn't run out. If you die, you'll lose it, but if you learn to not do that, this thing can wreak some serious havoc. What's entirely new to the series are the secret shops. These can be found by getting lucky and shooting a random point in the sky. Here you can get red and blue bottles. They extend and fill your health meter. That's another thing, the health meter. It's not just one hit death. While having tons of power-ups is cool, this game fails to capture the magic of the System 16 original. What they added is great. New power-ups and level mechanics are what you do for a sequel, but those health refills and super long item times, they make the game too easy. Every other game in the series has one hit death, but here, shit, you could take like five. I beat the whole thing on my third try. Another thing that hinders this game is the speed. It plays so much slower, and you're often just guessing which warp is gonna take you to the next level. Despite these issues, I still had a decent time, but I am confident in saying this is the black sheep of the series. Still, the game is solid. The graphics are phenomenal for the Master System. The sprite art and colors are beautiful. They far surpass the port of the original. The bosses remain a great part of this game, but again, are easy too. I really like the Space Harrier Dragon. He's difficult by the standards of this game, but still not too much of a threat. The cameo was cool, but that's the issue. These bosses have cool designs, but all could probably qualify as the first or second boss in the original game based on the fight they put up. Fantasy Zone 2 is flawed, but a good time. My main problem is there's just a lot of strange things they did with the gameplay that make it feel... off. With a sequel, there needs to be innovation, but they strayed too far from the original and the changes they made, I wouldn't consider to be the best. It's by far the easiest in the series, so if you enjoy the first and got decent at it, this will be a walk in the park. Please don't have this be your first Fantasy Zone game. It's a bad starting point. This game has two ports, the Famicom and the MSX2, both Japanese exclusives. Not looking forward to the MSX, so I'll do that one last. Fantasy Zone 2, the teardrop of Opa Opa. Yes, in this one, he cries but a single tear. Pretty much the same deal with the original Famicom port. It plays well, but looks a whole hell of a lot worse. The jump is more jarring this time. In the original, it was pretty much just duller colors and detail. Now the colors are just straight up ugly. If you can get past that, it's basically the same game and you'll have a fun time. MSX2, even with the more powerful hardware, this is still a crap port. A much, much better game than the original MSX port, but still, not fun. At least the graphics work. In fact, I think they look better than the NES, but there's still crappy scrolling, little to no animation, horrendous controls, bad collision detection, and slow ass speed. The MSX2 could not redeem itself. There's a clear winner here, and it's the Master System. Fantasy Zone 3, no, it's spin-off time. Fantasy Zone The Maze. Released in Japan as Opa Opa, this is of course a maze game. Is it as good as Pac-Man? No. Is it weird? Yes. Basically, it's the original Fantasy Zone in the style of a maze game. The worlds and enemies return. Collect the coins, don't get hit, purchase power-ups, it's all here, just in a different format. At the beginning of the stage, it tells you the prices of all the power-ups. Who would remember these? It goes by so fast that you'll never even pick them up in the first place. They could have just had it so when you afford them, they would blink green or something. Another addition I would have appreciated is a weapon timer. Your weapon can just run out before you expected, leaving you to die. Hit detection also isn't the greatest. When turning corners or scraping by an enemy, it is completely up in the air if you're gonna die or not. This game is challenging, but these little things make it frustrating. At the end of the level, depending on how fast you beat it, you'll get a bonus. The enemy mechanics are unique. Unlike the original Fantasy Zone, the bases move. There's a red circle in the middle and it's constantly filling up. If it reaches max level, it sends out enemies for the bases to spawn. These guys are a pain in the ass since they're fast and will hunt you down in no time. It creates the balance where you have to either play it safe and go back to the circle from time to time, or go for that bonus and have the screen fill up with bad guys. This and the power-up mechanic make Fantasy Zone the May is not just another Pac-Man clone, but I've found myself dying quite a bit. While I find them fun, maze games aren't really my thing, and I'm not the greatest at them. Hey, at least you can start from any level. Well, the later levels have more expensive power-ups, and when you start a new game, obviously you have no money, so you get to pick up from any world at the cost of it being much more difficult. So I end up just playing from the start. 
Difficulty is sorta of all over the place with this game. One stage in Ladoon absolutely destroyed me, while the entirety of the final world was really not that hard. This game certainly has a few issues, and maybe they prevent you from enjoying this game. I can totally see that, but if you can tolerate them, Fantasies on the Maze is enjoyable. While the maze game genre was dying out by 1987, this one has a lot of great ideas and so much strategy to it. Sega really did Fantasy Zone fans good, something that rarely happens these days. The soundtrack is remixes of all the original tunes, but because the FM unit was finally out, there's of course a soundtrack for that. The original was the first to mark three games, so it obviously didn't get that treatment. So I'm glad this game exists so I can hear all these songs in FM glory. While I don't think the graphics are as good as Fantasy Zone 2, they're decent and I can see what they were trying to achieve. This is definitely not going to be my first choice when it comes to playing a maze game. Hell, not even my first choice on the Master System, but every once in a while playing it for a few minutes is a great time. Would I recommend it? Nah. After watching this, if it seems like something you'd be interested in, go for it. But I probably wouldn't push other people to play this. Something I couldn't play is the co-op mode. This game is the prequel, and when you beat it with a buddy, you get to see how the story began. Maybe one day I'll be able to experience two players. Galactic Protector, the second spin-off. And when I say spin-off, I mean it. In order to control this game, you need Spin. Yes, the Sega Mark III paddle controller. Only four games required it. Alex Kidd BMX Trial, Megumi Rescue, Woody Pop, and this one. Playing any of these games is a hassle. Paddle controllers are rare and expensive. They also won't work on US Master System or Genesis with Power Base Converter. So you'd have to get a Sega Mark III. And that isn't the easiest thing either. So I'm gonna try my best playing this with a thumbstick. Of course, this isn't gonna control the best, but it's better than nothing. If you thought the maze was a bit random for Fantasy Zone standards, I have bad news for you. Galactic Protector has Opa Opa as a playable character. And that's about it Fantasy Zone wise. This game is still a shooter, but it more resembles Gyrus than anything else. You are the Galactic Protector, and what's there to protect in the galaxy? The planets. You spin around each planet and shoot down the asteroids and debris coming their way. Depending on how close each planet gets to an asteroid, their face will go from fine to panic attack. I love these faces. They're perfect. I'd call this one of the simplest games in the series. One of my favorite aspects of the Fantasy Zone games is that at first, it seems like there's not much to them. But when you peel back the layers and get more invested in the game, you discover new things and strategies. Here, shoot the asteroids. That doesn't mean this game is easy. It's hard, but the gameplay itself isn't engaging enough to continue playing. The only thing to talk about here is the game over screen. Opa Opa doesn't just turn into those blue circles. He's dead. He's really dead. It's no Russian Felix the Cat, but still out of place for the series. Because this game has little accessibility and overall lack of content, I can't say anyone outside of diehard Fantasy Zone fans should even consider this. Space Fantasy Zone for the PC Engine CD. This game was never released, but a near-finished prototype has been dumped online. This is the ultimate crossover of Space Harrier and Fantasy Zone. It's a shame it never came out. It was canned because at the time, Sega were about to release the Sega CD. Obviously, releasing a game on a competing CD console wouldn't be the greatest business move, but a worse business move was creating the Sega CD. So clearly they aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. Space Fantasy Zone takes Space Harrier's gameplay in Fantasy Zone's world and smashes them together. Like the maze, this is pretty much a retelling of the first game. Same levels and bosses with different gameplay. The new thing it adds is a store after every level. Welcome to Wep Donald's. An obvious parody of McDonald's. What might not be so obvious is the smile option. You know how McDonald's slogan over here is I'm loving it? Well in Japan, their equivalent is the smiles are free. So they even parodied that here since you can order one. As for all games in the series, the music is great but this game is extra special. The CD arrangement of Fantasy Zone and Space Harrier's themes works so well. However, as I mentioned before, this is a prototype of the game, and the only thing that isn't complete about it is the music. While pretty good, this is one of few tracks in the game, and of the few tracks, they just cut out at random sometimes. Thankfully, the gameplay is finished, and while the music is a bummer, at least the game doesn't break. Another minor annoyance is the scaling. As you can see, everything is pretty choppy. This is an issue in most of the Space Harrier games before the 32X version. Sega's arcade games were just miles ahead of the consoles at the time. And to be honest, you're probably better off playing Space Harrier, as Space Fantasy Zone is just that. Worse Space Harrier. The gameplay is good, but there isn't a game-changing thing they added to make this stand out. But if you like parody games, you can't go wrong with this one. As a big fan of the series, I probably get more enjoyment out of this game than someone who's new. I'm a huge fan of the Japanese parody genre, Fantasy Zone, and Space Harrier. 
So this game is made just for people like me. While there might be more fun games out there to play, it's still something I can appreciate and have a great time playing. If you have one of the many consoles that can play PC Engine CD games, give this one a burn. Fantasy Zone Gear. In the US and Europe, it was just released as Fantasy Zone, and since tons of Master System games were converted to the gear, a lot of people think this is just a port of the original port. Those people are wrong. This is a completely different game, and in fact, I think it's better than the Master System original. Releasing in 1991, the hardware has been out for a while, so Sanritsu really created something special. This feels like a continuation of the first game. There aren't too many mechanics or mix-ups. While this may seem like something to complain about, the series going back to its roots is a good thing, because the argument could be made that Fantasy Zone was on an unorganized decline. Super colorful detailed graphics and fantastic music make a comeback. However, the radar does not. And with this being a Game Gear game, unfortunately there's screen crunch. Remember how I said the camera in the original Fantasy Zone scrolled kinda awkwardly? Well, with the small screen, this one cranks that up to 11, and it's a very noticeable issue. You do eventually get used to it, but it's far more jarring and sometimes frustrating. Another issue is the collision detection. It's so wacky. Look at this. I just went through a coin. When I don't phase through coins, I collect them. And when that happens, I can spend them. I love the power-ups in this game. I'm glad they didn't just rehash the old stuff. The two new shots are awesome. The back shot has you shoot in both directions. This is especially useful because it's cheap, doesn't run out, and helps alleviate the screen crunch. If an enemy zips behind you, as long as you're shooting, you should be safe. There aren't only twin bombs, there's also twin missiles. These shoot both up and down at the same time. Great for bosses. The homing shot is also great for bosses, and like the back shot, it won't run out. The best thing this game adds is the flash shot. It's a special ability. By holding down the button, you start to flash and then release a super death beam. This is stupid overpowered and I love it. It can one-shot bases, take out bosses in a flash, and it goes through the things it kills, so you could follow it and have more enemies get knocked out. And the best part is, it never runs out. Opa Opa Jr.'s arsenal is so damn powerful in this game, it's insane. This is one of the main reasons I come back to Fantasy Zone Gear. The weapons are so fun. These awesome powers bounce off the game's difficulty. The bosses. Oh boy, the bosses. They are hard as hell. I had the most trouble with these guys out of any game in the series. From level 3 on, they took many, many tries to get down. Maybe it's because of the small screen, maybe they aren't designed right, but the difficulty of these guys is kinda absurd at first. One last thing, by pausing the game, you can change your weapons. This feature is fantastic. Why didn't the other games do this? It's so much better than hunting down those select balloons. This is a great continuation of Fantasy Zone. Two on the Master System is good, but this is a more traditional sequel that is still distinct enough to play. I love my Game Gear, and this is without a doubt my most played game. Worth every penny. Well, it's time for the last Retro Fantasy Zone game, Super Fantasy Zone on the Mega Drive. Not Genesis. It only came out in Japan and Europe. Sunsoft of Famicom Port fame developed this one, and they did an outstanding job bringing Fantasy Zone into the next generation. Each game in the series has a unique story, and this one is no exception. I don't want to spoil the ending, but here's a reading of the intro. In the space year 623X, an irregular gravitating phenomenon was found near the planet Menon. Menon is a planet near the frontier of the Fantasy Zone. To investigate this phenomenon, a space patrol was launched. During the voyage, the Science Patrol encountered a military troop and were attacked. Communication to the operation base in the Fantasy Zone were cut off. The military troop turned out to be the Dark Men in Force, who was planning to conquer the Fantasy Zone. The Dark Men in Force has been taking over planets on their way to the Fantasy Zone, and leaving a trail of destruction behind them, with no able to defeat this deadly invasion force. The Fantasy Zone seems doomed to be conquered. Oh Papa! father of the hero Opa Opa, launched a counterattack to stop the Dark Men in Force. His attempt turned out to be futile. Opapa and his once mighty armada have been destroyed by this enemy's mighty force, and Opapa was fatally wounded during the attack. Now, there was no stopping the invading enemy troops.
Opa Opa, having heard of his father's faith, vowed to avenge his father's death and restore peace to the Fantasy Zone. For a series with bright and happy graphics and music, it sure has one hell of a plot. We're three traditional games in at this point, you know what to expect. Shoot down the bases, avoid the enemies, beat the boss, head to the shops, whoa, that is a lot of power-ups. Opa Opa's base speed is pretty good in this game, so while every other game I go for the jet engine, here I only need the big wings. I've always gone with the twin bombs, but this game has something better, quartet missiles. These are like the homing shot from gear, but as bombs that shoot out four at a time. You can keep firing them on bosses to just focus on avoiding their attacks. If a bunch of little enemies are closing in on you, fire out the quartet missiles. Where this game shines are all the bonus power-ups. There's 11 of them. The sheer amount of things to buy here is great. One of my favorite things about playing the original for the first time is trying out all the power-ups. Having a whole bunch more to experiment with makes this game that much more fantastic. After playing a bunch of 8-bit sequels and spin-offs, coming back to a 16-bit Fantasy Zone game is so much better. This is the true successor to the System 16 arcade original. This game captures that Sega magic they've lost as of recent. Awing at the beautiful backgrounds, jamming out to excellent music, playing the game over and over to master it. It may be a home game, but it has all the aspects of a Sega arcade classic. Sunsoft knew what they were doing. This game is a true showcase of the Genesis. The YM2612 was a tricky beast, but they hit it out of the park with this soundtrack. Same with the graphics. This is the best looking game in the series yet. The last handful of games weren't necessarily designed the tightest. With a weird collision detection, funky scrolling, and strange controls, this game has none of that. Sunsoft gave it their all, making this a balanced, well-programmed game. My favorite kind of games are the ones that are super challenging, but fair. Gameplay that is fun, no matter if you're getting your ass handed to you, or you've played for hours and mastered it. And you will get your ass handed to you. Like all the other games in the series, it has that signature challenge. But I think they went a little overboard. I found there are more frustrating moments with artificial difficulty than the original. But still, Super Fantasy Zone surpasses the original in every way, and if you beat the first one and loved it, you gotta play this game. It improves on the formula, has an even catchier soundtrack, and is graphically astonishing for the Genesis. I love this game so much, and I'm very glad it was finally included in the Genesis Mini. This game skipped every Genesis compilation. Hopefully, this means we'll get more re-releases in the future, because this game wholeheartedly deserves them. Super Fantasy Zone was the final game in the series. So where did it go from here? In 1997, Sega released an arcade perfect port to the Sega Saturn under the Sega Ages series. This is a fantastic way to play the original if you want to go retro. There's only a few minor gameplay tweaks you can activate. Other than that, there's nothing else to this game. I wouldn't pay too much for this one, but if you can find it for a price tag you agree with, pick it up. The additions are minor, but it's still the same great Fantasy Zone you know and love. Fantasy Zone got the Sega Ages 2500 remaster treatment over on the PS2. You might also know this as the Sega Classics Collection. The graphics are now 3D with cell shading and they look nice. Normal mode has a few minor differences. It tones down a few weapons. In the original, you could use three smart bombs to take out the boss from World 4. Here, that doesn't work anymore. The biggest addition is the special stage after every boss. They'll spit out coins and you control Opa Opa like he does in Space Fantasy Zone, grabbing all those coins. Arcade mode doesn't have the special stage and also removes the little animations they added. However, the smart bomb trick still doesn't work, so it isn't one to one with the original. Little changes aside, this is pretty much just the original Fantasy Zone, is what most people say. In this game is a surprise. Challenge mode. Here you can pick any stage and try to beat it without losing a life. After that, you take your earned coins and can spend them in the shop. This isn't a parts shop. Here you can buy four brand new stages. Gameplay tweaks like no item price inflation, auto fire, and insanely broken power-ups. Hardcore Fantasy Zone fans, this one's for you. If you've mastered the first game, challenge mode on the PS2 is a great way to shake it up a bit. Sega Ages, Volume 33. The Fantasy Zone Collection. This disc is for the mega fan like me. It's why I own it. This compilation includes every game in the series and quite a few of their ports. Let me just go over everything on the disc. Fantasy Zone 1, the System 16 and Mark 3 versions. Fantasy Zone 2, the Mark 3 and System E versions. Opa Opa, the Mark 3, System E, and US Master System versions. Galactic Protector, Fantasy Zone Gear, and Super Fantasy Zone. 
but that ain't it. There are two original games on here, Fantasy Zone Neo Classic. Neo Classic is Sunsoft's Famicom port enhanced, better graphics and music. I have no idea why they made this. M2 put all this work in making a better version of a worse port that couldn't even run on the original hardware on a disc with the arcade original on it. If it were for the people who are nostalgic for that version, it would have been easier and more effective to just put the original on there without change. This game will never cease to perplex me. The other new game on this disc is Fantasy Zone 2 DX. Fellas, this is the best game in the series. As I said before, Fantasy Zone 2 was never a System 16 arcade game. M2 created a reboot of Fantasy Zone 2 on original System 16 hardware. Yes, this game will run on the Sega arcade hardware from the 80s. Well, they created a board called the System 16C. It is the same exact hardware, but with a RAM expansion. So yes, you can use an old board to play this new game. It'll just need a little upgrade. Who but M2 to create a brand new game for old arcade hardware? They could have just done a reimagining, but worked in the limitations of old tech. Bravo. So you know how each game had a complicated story, but it was pretty much exclusive to the manual and ending scene? Well, at the start of each world, you get a little summary of what's going on. This is a fantastic way to tell a story in an arcade game. Just a few sentences to read so that things don't slow down. While the hardware is old, one thing I love about this game is the detail here. Now, I probably sound like a broken record praising this entire series for all its pleasant graphics, but seriously, just look at this game. Every time I play it, I notice a little something new. Look at Opa Opa's walk cycle. That's adorable. This isn't a 16-bit version of Fantasy Zone 2. Far from it. This is a reboot. It takes the idea and a few bosses, but completely revamps the gameplay. In the original, you had to wander all over the place looking for warps. Here, there are two dimensions to flip between, light and dark. The bases you destroy carry over, so you could take out everything on the light side, warp to dark, and there would only be one left. This completely fixes the pacing issues with the original game's design. Levels take half as long and are much more fun to complete. Challenging too. A huge issue I had with the original two was the difficulty. They don't mess around with that in DX. While it isn't super fantasy zone hard, I'd call it harder than the original, but man, they perfected the challenge here. I didn't have a single frustrating moment. All games in the series had at least one moment that felt a little bullshit, but here, all fair, no gimmicks. I felt like I wasn't buying as many power-ups to cheese the bosses or just get through things. With just a good engine and big bombs, I mastered the ins and outs of this one. Secret shops return by shooting a hidden point in either the top or bottom of the dark side. You can open up a little place to buy weapons before they become available in the light side shop. I like to get the big twin bombs. These are awesome to do tons of damage, taking out bosses in a flash. After all those bases are taken out, it's boss time. They didn't just copy the bosses from the original. And if they did use the same ones, they changed up their style quite a bit. Take Iceburn, for example. In the original, all you have to do is shoot him until he shatters. Here, you have to break open his ice rectangle and shoot his eye. This is a callback to Wink Run from the original Fantasy Zone. This is a more complicated and harder version of the original Iceburn, and is significantly more fun to fight. There are also brand new bosses. Unfortunately, the Space Harrier Dragon doesn't return and is replaced by Bomdrin. While that might be a little disappointing, all the other bosses and changes they made are so much better than the originals. These quality of life adjustments make Fantasy Zone 2 feel like the sequel it should have been. In fact, it's better than anyone deserved. The story here is great, but I'm not going to share it. I want you to experience this game for yourself. It's so much better that way. This is Fantasy Zone at its peak. The design, graphics, and music, oh man, the music. The original soundtrack was pretty good, but it felt hindered by the hardware. Here we got that YM2151 goodness and arrangements on the originals done by the legendary hero. Everything comes together to make a package worth celebrating. The effort and energy in this game is something rarely seen with a Sega game nowadays. You can tell the developers love Fantasy Zone and know it works. I think I'd call this one of my all-time favorite games. The joy I got while playing this was unrivaled. So what's Fantasy Zone like now? In 2009, there was an LCD toy. Cool. But five years later, Sega and M2 started making their perfect retro re-releases. The Sega 3D Fukoku Archives. These are absolutely phenomenal retro remasters. I really want to review them, but unfortunately, I don't have a way to capture 3DS footage, and they don't work in Citra. So yeah, 
We're going old school, pointing the camera at the 3DS and turning all the lights off. America only got the second volume, but most of the games were released a la carte on the eShop. 3D Fantasy Zone, Opa Opa Bros, was part of the first compilation, but as I said, it's on the eShop. As you can see, this is a port of the first game. All the games released in this line make good use of 3D. Seeing all your favorite Super Scalar games with this much depth is great. It feels like these games were made to show off the 3DS. They already looked fantastic on their own, but in 3D, I can tell you about how amazing it looks, but you really have to see it for yourself. And if you have a 2DS, I'm very sorry. So, what did they add here? Well, there's the standard stuff you can tweak like lives, difficulty, and button mapping, but also level select. If you beat a level, you can start from it. When you get to certain coin milestones, you can get extended and infinite weapon times along with Gold Rush, a mode where enemies drop a ton of money. It's the same fantasy zone you know and love, but wait, it's called Opa Opa Bros. Who is the bro? Upa Upa from the Master System spin-offs. After you beat the game, you get to unlock his mode. Using your coin stock, you have access to every gun and every bomb. Here's the catch. Every single shot will cost you. Want to use the seven-way shot? Watch your wallet drain. This is a cool addition that isn't just an expert mode. It's a creative change of pace. You know what else is on 3DS? Fantasy Zone 2DX, hell yeah! It's widescreen now. All the little changes are here, along with a brand new game, Link Loop Land. Since it's endless, and of course the objective is to survive as long as possible and get a high score, the main way of racking up the points is through the link system. Everything drops coins. A ton of coins. Coins are everywhere, but you can't spend them. You want to collect as many as you can to make the link gauge go up. It's constantly going down, and you want to keep that cash flow going so you don't lose your combo. The boss can help a lot. After destroying all the bases, you fight the same boss, but every shot you get on him, he'll drop coins. He isn't that hard to beat. So this is a great boost to your multiplier. Since you have a power up, getting hit makes you drop it, but a repairer appears and you can run into it to regain your arsenal. Or you can wait it out and it will transform into a fever balloon. This gives you the 12-way shot for a limited period of time. That's all there is to Link Loop Land, but its simplicity is golden. The formula works so well. The gameplay mechanics of 2DX are already incredible, so making another game within it was a smart move. And it really does feel completely unique from the rest of the series. Fantasy Zone 2 W is the best way to play the best game in the series, which doubles as one of the best Sega games of all time. I know a lot of people have moved on from the 3DS, but it's worth dusting off. Nintendo's output on Switch as of recent hasn't really been my thing, so I got a used new 3DS and have been rediscovering the library, and I gotta say, this is objectively the best Nintendo console. I could go in depth and talk about all the reasons why, and a bunch of games I like, but that's a story for another time. That time being if I ever get a damn capture card. But for now, please buy the Sega 3D Classics Collection. It's pure arcade bliss. Finally, Sega Ages Fantasy Zone on the Nintendo Switch. Remember those changed bosses in the Master System version? They're back. This is a port of Opa Opa Bros. Did Sega miss something? The perfect version of the greatest Fantasy Zone game was on 3DS. Why this isn't on Switch puzzles me. The Sega 3D Classics line flopped hard in America, and this game really deserved a second chance on Switch. There are a million ways to play the original Fantasy Zone, and while I gotta admit this is the best way, it makes me incredibly sad knowing that 2W is stuck on 3DS. Sega Sammy even said the Sega Ages series is done after this. Man. And we all know how Sega is about re-releasing anything that isn't Yakuza or Sonic. Hey, at least the Classics Collection is cheap. I figure once the 3DS hits that nostalgia craze in less than 10 years, hidden gems like these are gonna rise in price. So to all 3D and 2DS owners of the world, buy this game. You will have a fantastic time. As of today, that was every Fantasy Zone game. Before I wrap things up, let me just talk about some other cool things about the series. Opa Opa is referenced in a ton of Sega games. Too many to count. So here are a few of my favorites. Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf. Opa Opa is the selection icon, and if you take 99 strokes on a hole, then do the Konami code, you get to play this secret minigame. Some people have said this was the first level of Fantasy Zone, but it's not that. You try to survive as long as you can, and destroying the bases will actually end the game. It isn't very fun, but this makes this game a whole hell of a lot more memorable. Alex Kidd The Lost Stars. The objective of this game is to find the miracle ball. One of these is, you guessed it, 
Opa Opa, Zillion. Zillion was a sci-fi anime multimedia franchise that Sega had a hand in. They made two Master System games, produced some toys. The guns in the anime have the same design as the Master System light phaser. You know who else is in the anime? This little guy. Opa Opa is a minor character but worth watching the show for. Just look at him. He's also a playable character in Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. What about a game where he is the vehicle? Look no further than Sonic Riders featuring an Opa Opa themed board. You can play the original Fantasy Zone in an arcade in Yakuza 0. What about a non-Sega game? Taito's own horizontal shmup, Darius Burst, has a Fantasy Zone DLC pack you can purchase. You can get an Opa Opa toy in Shenmue, Yakuza 0, and Hatsune Miku Project Mirai DX. This little guy really is everywhere but a new game. I could go on and on about these cameos. Finally, the album. Released in 2008 alongside the Sega Ages collection, this box set contains nearly every song in the franchise. And it has the catchy name of... Fantasy Zone. Ultra Super Big Maximum Great Strong Complete Album. I have to agree. This album is indeed Ultra Super Big Maximum Great Strong and Complete. I love owning this and wish more franchises got cool stuff like this. But as far as official Fantasy Zone merch goes, this is about it. Quality over quantity. But I bet a lot of people would buy a plushie or two. You know I would. I have officially run out of things to talk about relating to Fantasy Zone. I love this series. If you really need a reminder, just look at this video's length. I can gush even longer about all the little things in this series that make me happy, but if you did look at that timestamp, that isn't going to happen. The main takeaway from this video, give these games a try. Chances are you haven't played them, and if I did my job correctly, you want to try them out now. Thankfully, the series is accessible on a ton of different devices and platforms, and if you can watch a YouTube video, you most likely have some sort of a way to play one of the greatest shoot 'em ups of all time. Thank you for sticking to the end of this long ass video. If you enjoyed it, let me know. If you didn't, I'd also like to know that too. If you'd like to support the channel and see more videos in the future, I'm sure you know how to do that as well. Believe it or not, I'm off to go play some more Fantasy Zone, and I really hope that you are too. I'm Amiben, and I'll catch you later. Bye.